everybody see all right? Yeah, brilliant. Great. Thank you for the introduction, Leah. Um, so yes, my presentation just sort of emerges from my PhD project on ocular injuries during the national strike. And today I'll be talking a bit about um, debilitation, disablement and injustice, uh, perspectives on ocular injuries inflicted by non-lethal weapons, um, mainly drawing on my research, but also thinking about some, some other discussions that will probably not fit into the um, thesis itself. Um, so yes, a bit of context. Um, the national strike of 2021 broke out in April of 2021. It was essentially sort of decrying lack of support and dignified living conditions, um, and among other dynamics that sort of connect to Colombia's ongoing political transition away from decades of armed conflict. Um, and they were massive protests that broke out among um, some of the bigger cities in, in Colombia, as well as um, some rural areas. This is an image of the Edwards Monument in Bogota. Um, which is my home city, uh, taken in May 2021. Um, and they were met with repression and use of force from police. Um, and sort of there were many reports of police brutality, of sexual violence, of gender-based aggressions. Um, but I will specifically focus on ca the cases of ocular injuries that were registered. There were 103 cases of ocular injuries that were reported between April 21st and July 20th, 2021 um, by an NGO called Temblores, Pais, which is a law clinic and Amnesty International. Um, but we have to take into account that many more probably happened um, simply because there is a sub, this is a sub register and um, it might have been quite difficult to report them. Um, and also this is mainly concentrated in sort of the broader cities, um, might have been diff more difficult to report cases in the peripheries. Um, also due to intimidation, lack of access, um, etc. And this sort of prompted some reflections um, that connected to some of my sort of um, academic and political interests uh, from, from, pre from, from before. Um, the first sort of big motivation for carrying out and beginning this research was the need for historical memory of the events of the national strike, uh, beyond simply historical memory for the events that, that were sustained during, or for the violence that was sustained during the armed conflict, sort of connecting forms, mutating forms of violence, as was already picked up in one of the previous uh, presentations. And I also see political value in registering and also contesting narratives of, around disability, social protest, and longer, subtler, more sustained or durational forms of harm. This also connected to my general interest in disability and embodiment in social protest and broader social movements. Um, this was specifically around accessibility to protest and the forms and the ways in which we see bodies in protest, specifically how disabled bodies appear or don't appear or excluded from protesting spaces, as well as metaphors around individual and social, social bodies, how disability is some, sometimes taken up rhetorically within social justice practice. And so um, my research question for the PhD, um, or the sort of broader research, um, was is, is mainly about what narratives can tell us about ocular, what narratives about ocular mutilation can tell us about the relationships between violence, the state, and the disabled or debilitated bodies of the citizenry. And here I want to sort of pause on how I understand narratives. I, I see them sort of as stories that you use to make sense of things. Um, in this case, episodes of violence that can radically alter a person's embodiment and their life conditions, um, and that was also caused by the state. So I see that these stories can help us understand the connection connections between um, debilitation, disablement, the state as an actor that produces that disablement, and then violence um, that is not only sort of produced by the state, but also um, replicated by sort of um, the social attitudes towards disabled people. So sort of my main objective um, around this research is to identify and sort of, sort of characterize the narrative that accompany what Jasbir Pua calls the life history of a maiming. And this is key because I see that one of, um, and this comes from sort of my theoretical readings, um, that have made me more attuned to sort of the long-term effects of something that can be, of a violence that can be sort of discreet and spectacular as ocular injury is, um, but also the forms of violence that are omitted, um, the more sort of the slow death, the slow violence um, and the debilitation that, that takes place as well as um, the physical disablement. And in Sort of in tune with that, I want to sort of outline some of the long lasting effects of ocular mutilation, which include obviously the long term sort of physiological harm, um, the functionality that is affected in the eye and in the face and in sort of the um, morphological and physiological structures, but then also the impacts on the life course, the barriers to employment that victims may face, the medical debt that they often face due, due to the 
um, lack of, of medical support and access to, to prosthetics um, and other types of treatment, specifically also uh, mental health treatment, but also the impact upon the families of victims. Um, often so the, the um, main victims of ocular mutilation in Colombia were young men, young um, sort of young, poor young men from urban centers. Um, and they were often sort of the primary breadwinners of their families. So they now their families acquire care responsibilities, but also um, face sort of the um, financial impacts of that injury. Another point here is that it, ocular injuries also dissuade protest for fear of being for fear for protesters' fear of being harmed and of and use of, and disability is sort of weaponized against social protest. Therefore, it's not just the physical bodies of the citizens, citizenry that are disabled and debilitated, but also the social bodies that rise up in protest. Um, given the fear of, of becoming disabled, that can also dissuade protest. There are also, as I mentioned, trauma and psychosocial impacts. Um, including um, many victims who report sort of having a, an irrational fear of losing the other eye. Um, and then also the fact of acquiring a disability in already inaccessible and ableist con context. Um, further to that, there are also um, sort of the, the broader aggressions that victims may face due to the fact that the ocular injury is read as a sign of participation in protest, which is stigmatized and criminalized in Colombia. Um, I've included some images of um, victims of ocular mutilation. This is also um, a late kind of trigger warning. Some of the images that I do include um, are of, of victims of ocular violence. The first on the left is a drawing of Esteban Mosquera, who was actually injured in 2018 in the student protests and later assassinated um, in, in August 2021. Um, and to the right, there is an image of Sara Cárdenas, who was injured um, in 2021 as a minor, she's holding up a banner that says, I'm sorry to inform the ESMAD, which is the um, riot police, that out of my right eye, that I, out of which I can still see, I see a better future for my country. Um, Sara Cárdenas is currently in political exile due to the death threats that she faced, as well as her mother, who was also a survivor of ocular injury, and both of them also based gender-based violence based gender based violence when they were injured and um, so there is this ongoing discrimination faced by victims of, of um, ocular injury and one of the effects of this is the re-entrenchment of ableist paradigms most egregiously this idea that disability is a fate worse than death and this comes not only from the Colombian context but also other contexts such as Kashmir um, here I featured two sort of um, testimonies from, from different reports from Kashmir, somebody um, sort of talking about how the pellet guns kill and maim and the life of the maim becomes worse than being killed. Pellet guns are not non-lethal. Um, in Colombia, another testimony reads, it would have been better if they had killed me. Maybe in death, I would not have faced this emotional pain that I must now carry for the rest of my life. And um, this also signals to um, the psychosocial impacts that come from ocular mutilation. And so what this does is raise questions about disability justice and thinking about the relationships and the tensions between diversity and harm. Um, and as was said in the report from Amnesty International by Ethan Dimbloris, it is difficult for a person who has been abused for exercising a right, the right to protest, um, and has, as a consequence, experienced deterioration in their senses or functionality, which in the case of ocular injury um, results in, in vision impairment, to embrace the discourse on the value of diversity. And this also connects to the fact that within a, a country that has faced an ongoing conflict of you know, decades, there are existing associations between disability and trauma or between disability and violence. So there are significant limitations of humanitarianism, human rights frames, or the framework of disability pride to account for the experiences of people whose disability um, was is a function of vulnerability or is a function of violence. Um, and here it's really crucial to recognize the leadership of the most affected and the fact that identifying as disabled can pose a significant danger in some contexts, specifically in Colombia. Um, and so, so Thinking about the theoretical aspect of this, this also asks us to contextualize the social model of disability within the global South or rethink the social model with a global perspective. And this is this draws on the work of Raywin Connell and her theory of ontoformativity, um, Helen Mikosha, who has worked on um, globalizing and decolonizing disability studies, Karen Soldatic, who was just here, uh, who has also done um, a lot of work thinking about 
the limitations of, of the Convention for the Rights of People with Disabilities, Nimala Aravels, who has also thought about sort of disability in a global context, and mainly, and this is who I draw most from, Jasbir Pawar's work on the right to Maine, which is sort of the analytical framework that she proposes. Um, and I won't dwell here on, on this, um, because it's a huge topic and you can maybe talk about it in the breakout rooms or in the discussion session. Um, but what Jasbir Pawar does is, is propose ability as a concept that triangulates between disability and ability. And ability is not just becoming disabled, but also the gradual wearing down of individual and social bodies. And this is something that Kirsty touched on um, in her presentation about the slow forms of violence and the prolonged temporalities of disablement and, de and debilitation and how violence can come in the form of misery. So this asks us to complicate violence and attend to the structural, the slow and the economic harms um, that can be wrought on bodies of people. And thinking Thanks, about- you. Just to let you know, you've got about five minutes. Brilliant. Um, not only just the effects of disablement, but also everything that has to happen before somebody um, is hit in the eye with a rubber bullet, right? This marking, this maiming, and this form of transforming um, bodies and lives into, as Kirsty was mentioning, their life, teaching through cruelty and weaponizing disability as a form of stigma, and as Rita Segato would put it, killing a de-ritualized death. And so from this, we, we take that the impact happens long before the shot is taken and continues to resonate long after the moment it strikes the eye. This means, in general, thinking about ocular injury, not just in, in sort of the case of my research, that the spatial and temporal frame of understanding these injuries needs to be broadened to account for the drawn out violence and the transnational elements, which is what I focus on. So ocular mutilation on a, global, on a global scale reveals that there are certain dynamics of harms that can talk about an international epidemic of dead eyes. So here we have images from Colombia and from Kashmir. Um, they, there have also been reports of this happening in Spain, in Chile during the 2019 demonstrations, in France, um, in relation to the Yellow Vest protests, in Hong Kong. And this is not only just relating to victimization of those who, who finally sustain the ocular injuries in the moment of protest, but also um, the networks of weapons trade and how discourses, material artifacts such as non-lethal weapons, but also information um, move through different countries and through different contexts. So there is an international circulation of information, artifacts and discourses that are involved in the scenario of the ocular injury. And this, um, I can expand on this afterwards. This comes from um, an investigation by a Colombian journalist who traced how these weapons sort of circulated among these countries um, and they come from the same supplier. And the same supplier, as was revealed by another journalist who is actually a, a victim of ocular injury himself, um, also accounts for other forms of non-lethal harm in the form of environmental exposure. So this is another form of disablement and another form of debilitation that doesn't happen in the moment or the, the discrete moment of the deployment of the weapons, but rather is sustained. Um, and this happens when these, these companies test their weapons in residential areas. Um, and so this asks us not only to consider the, the networks of harm that are involved in producing ocular injuries, but also the potential networks of care. Um, and looking at ocular injury from a transnational perspective asks us to connect and learn from practices and initiatives that have emerged to account for ocular injury around the world. This includes mutual aid groups and street medics who respond to these injuries when they happen in Chile, Colombia, Hong Kong, France, they have been um, documented, but also expand to new frames of analysis that allow us to connect contexts that would otherwise not be thought of together uh, through the commonalities of this practice. It also asks us to interrogate the symbolism around the eye and visuality and vision, the trip that sort of um, trope of vision is mastery to understand what the cultural locations of disability around the world are and how it is deployed in protest. And to close, I know I only have around a minute, um, this is where I'd like to sort of receive the most feedback. These are sort of that, the, um, the approaches that I've taken or that I want to take to my own research. And it's first of all, sort of this doubly engaged social research of um, understand, taking, taking the core to produce academic research with and for those involved in the situation, in this case, ocular injuries, and co-produce and collaborate as another form of peer review, under, really understanding that the research has to make sense for those 
who are most affected. Um, this integrates the disability justice principles that were outlined by Sins and Ballard, um, recenters Latin American roots of action research and participatory research, and I seek specifically to interrogate the methods of participatory film, as I mentioned previously, but also have an advisory group, again, as a form of peer review to make sure that the re research is indeed relevant. Um, yes, and with that, I will close because we're just coming up to time. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a very impressive amount of information to get into 15 minutes. Um, and I'll just stop the, stop the recording.